we do use this. You pretend you're behind basically the wheel of a car. It's the same thing. You're in the driver's seat, you know, you have all these little handles, right? And the object is to make sure that you do it in a way that looks like you're coordinating, right? You don't want to do this, you don't want to do this, you don't want to do this. So you're always going to do it in a logical manner, right? So everything's logical. Right? Where your hands fall in place is where you should approach it, right? So, on here, plant yourself behind the carriage, right? And then you're going to go to the right, stop, you're going to go to the left, stop, you're going to go in towards the center, stop, go out, and away from the center, stop. So now the other thing we've done here, you've already seen that exercise, right? What we've done is we've loaded the actual workpiece into the chuck. This is called a chuck, okay, a three-jot chuck. Now if you look on here, you have a zero, or you don't have a zero, right? You've got three of these satellites, and uh, the zero position is typically the position where the part that you're loading in is going to be the most precise. So if one was to put an indicator on here, and actually check it through its rotation, it would be most accurate on position zero. That would be where you tighten it, okay? To actually untighten it doesn't really matter which one you use, but when you reload, try to search for a zero or whatever the most important mark. So in here, on the left side of the machine, you have typically, uh, at least in North America, you have what they call the headstock. In the headstock, you have the gear works. In this particular case, on this machine, you have a selection of three, six, nine speed combinations. Right? And as you can see, they're identified by three dial knobs. And what you do is you pick a speed that you want, and then rotate the dials one at a time until it clearly you know, comes into that position. So as an example, if you want a 355, right? You scroll across to B, 2, 3. So then B, and then 2, and then again. Now, this area here, the top section is not synchronized. And basically what that means is that the machine has to be stationary, it can't be running, right? When you're actually selecting the speeds, it has to be stopped, and then you manually select them until you get what you want. In the case of where one of the dials won't go fully into its detender position, you have to actually physically rock the chart by hand until it clearly engages. The lower section down here is for the feed control. Right? The feed control is related to the carriage. If you look inside here, you've got all these different little drive axes, right? The drive shafts. Right? So what you do here is you create a, call it a feed or a velocity or given whatever, uh, it's just called feed rate, okay? And it is directly uh, synchronized with the rotation of the chuck. You have various selections. Typically when you're working on a lathe or a mill or any of these things, well, there's a standard, you've got your 3, your 6, and your 12, and what that simply means is for every one turn of the chuck, right, let's say as an example on a 3,000 feed rate, the carriage will advance at 3,000 revolution, or 6,000, or 12,000, depending on how you have it set. The right hand end is the head stop, or the tail stop. Right. The tailstock has a locking device here, right, which keeps the tailstock firmly in its position. It's fully adjustable throughout the length of the bed, right. So all you do is that, you know, as, you, as required, you, know, you can use it as a center drilling, a drilling, or whatever type of operation, or you can use it to support extended, very, very long pieces, you know, where the stability is important, and so forth. And the tail stock has a quill inside it, and the quill has a taper inside it, more is taper. Right? Each machine is a little bit different, they come in different sizes. This one would be more as three. Right? If you look over here, you've got your some of the components, right? You've got your these are called drill trucks here, right? And the one on the left here, this is called the live center. So the live center is the thing that will be used in supporting extended like a very long piece and so forth. Okay. On this machine here, we have some safety features, right? 
as you get more and more modern, right, the safety features are obviously more increased, right? This is the one of the last acquisitions we made, right? And it has very few machines actually have that. It has a safety guard in here. The safety guard is two full, right? This one here has a limit switch right over here where when the guard is up, you can't activate the spindle. You can't turn it up. And when it's down, the limit switch bypasses and when you turn it on, it turns on. Yeah. It also is not only a chip guard, but a water guard. Usually these things tend to be a little bit wider so that when you're when you're cooling a workpiece and as soon as the coolant hits the jaws, it acts like a fan. So it disperses the water, right, which will come all over you on the floor. So the chip guard or the wash guard, whatever you want to call it, prevents that from happening as well. So usually the power switches are at the back of a machine, that's the main power coming in, right? And then the regular turn-on switches are in the front. So usually I tell a student, well, first of all, they have to ask in the beginning, but once they understand it, that's the typical procedure. So you go to the back of the machine, there's two positions, you have horizontal, and when I turn it clockwise, right, I turn it on. Typically, in almost every case I've ever seen, clockwise is typically turn on and counterclockwise is turn off. That's the way I've seen it for almost everything, okay? Now, there might be the odd exception, however, this is pretty much standard. Okay. And what I've done here is it gets a little confusing. Because really, you could rotate the switch this way or the other way, right? So what I did is I put some arrows on here to show the actual confinement of the rotation. So it's a 90 degree rotation. Okay. And also in the back of the machine, we have the switch for the actual readout, the electronic readout. And as here, and they are typically above where the plug comes in, okay? So that's all we have to know for the back of the machine. Now we go to the front. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the readout and how it works. And it's just gonna be, we're gonna be flip-flopping in certain areas, because sometimes you have to do that, right? Since we are using readouts on pretty much everything we have in here, right, is we have to keep adding it in between, like, in the conversation itself. So once the power has been engaged, on this particular readout, we have X clear, X clear, Z clear. And that puts it into the neutral mode. So out right here, the switch from where it is now, which is the metric system of millimeters, just hit this button here, now you're on inches. You leave it on incremental and you leave it on diameter. When you're working on a lathe, a lathe creates a round object, right? Plane. And round planes have diameters, right? Even though, yes, there is a radius to a round plane, but when you measure that roundness, right, you are measuring the diameter. So therefore, you always keep it in diameter and not in radius, 